First, Dr. Brown, thank you so much for joining us. The thank Vice's helmet has been around for how long now? So last year was the first full year that the helmet was out in the NFL and in the uh, NCAA. Right, and Russell Wilson using it as well as some other um, high-profile people. Yeah, Russ wore the helmet all year last year. What's the difference this helmet can make when it comes to preventing what we're seeing in terms of people like Tyler? Well, we've taken an approach that's fairly simplistic from the standpoint that we think less force uh, is a better thing. And so as these impacts are happening, we want to see as much force mitigation as we can. And so the, the uh, helmet's designed with that particular aspect in mind. Gotcha. And Chris, you surveyed um, more than 100 Seahawks players, asking them were they concerned about brain injuries. And this investigation was a couple of months ago. Mm -hmm. When you look at what you learned in that investigation and what has come out in light of this, what is, what, how has that shaped what you're thinking now? Yeah, well, this is a 21-year-old kid, right? And his right. brain was damaged for playing football. Now, this survey that I sent out to hundreds of former uh, Seahawks players uh, told me that by the time you're a professional football player, you're pretty concerned that your brain's getting damaged. I mean, 50% of those that responded to us said that uh, they thought their brain was damaged. 40% more said they were unsure. This is one guy who died uh, back in 2012. Let's see if we can see a picture of uh, uh, Grant Feasel. He was the long snapper, the center for the Seattle Seahawks, died in 2012, a broken man. Uh, his life had just deteriorated. And here's what his widow told us about what happened after he died. Well, Grant's brain went to the Boston University. And after Dr. Ann McKee, who is the leading pathologist there, did um, the report, it came back as stage three CTE. So there's four stages and Grant had stage three. She said that if he'd lived for one more year, he would have been mindless. It just made, it all started making sense to me that Grant had been losing his mind our entire marriage from the time that he quit playing football. So Cindy Fiesel was so full of regret when she learned that her husband had stage three CTE. Tyler. Polinsky supposedly had stage one, but that's what's so concerning. We're talking about a 21-year-old kid here. Exactly. And then there was the study out of Boston today talking about before the age of 12 is when some of this stuff can happen, right? Yeah, Boston University's been doing so much studying in this area, and what they determined was that uh, if you start playing before contact football before age 12, your chances of being brain injured and at least showing the symptoms uh, go up considerably. So that's kind of information for parents that uh, maybe contact football before the age of 12 is not advised. Exactly. Now, Drew, I want to bring you into this conversation because you featured a school that was taking a different approach. Yep, Bremerton High School, they went to a, uh, a jamboree last summer out in Oregon, and they noticed a, a team in, from Tualatin that had this padding on the outside of their helmets. So the coach asked the other coach, they're called guardian caps. Okay. We have some video of the caps to, to give you a little sense of what they look like. Basically, it's a, it's a strap, Velcro strap that places on, on top of any size football helmet. And the manufacturers say that it reduces and softens the blow by about 15 to 33 percent in some cases. Whether or not it protects young students from getting concussions is still still not determined. But the thought is it can't hurt, and it does reduce the uh, the, the incidental kind of injuries where you have someone with a regular helmet who may just bonk into somebody's knee. That player's knee might get hurt. That knee could easily cause an injury as well. Mm -hmm. So the coach feels like it can't hurt and he knows that he's facing a, a changing culture where parents may not want to sign their kids up for football. So mm -hmm. he says this shows that we are trying to make it safer. They only use it for practices at this point. Someday down the line, a lot of folks would like to see these in games. We're not at that point yet because not a lot of schools are doing it, but he was one of about a dozen schools in Washington that have signed up for it. Yeah, and Dr. Brown, what are you making of this? No, I think, position. Yeah, I mean, I think we're all, you know, saddened and, and scared seeing some of the news that, that came out today. But I, I want to put it into context, Please. too. So as we talk about CTE and the, and the fear, I talk to, you know, families. I, I talk to, you know, the kids that come in to see us through clinic about football and other sports participation. So I try to gauge it in a variety of different ways for the families. One is, you know, we want kids out being active and participating. And I think the decision for which sport people are going to play, they have to look at many different factors, sort of what's your family risk tolerance? 
Are you going to be able to play in an environment where it's well coached, where the rules are followed? Are you going to have appropriate equipment to be able to play? And so these are conversations I'm having with my patients uh, routinely. And when you hear the data that comes out about CTE, I think it's very important from a public health perspective to put it into context. Majority of the players that have come forward have had pre-existing uh, issues and the sample size is still relatively small. It's but it is worrisome and we need to follow this and understand it better. Who's susceptible? Why are some people getting this and others are right. not? And we don't know those answers. Yeah, yet. and I'm sorry to cut you off a little prematurely. I know we're running out of time, but here's the thing. I mean, we all have kids. I mean, those here on the couch, you know, Drew and Chris, and we have kids who play sports. And, it, and it's not just football. I mean, we had a study a couple of months ago, small to your point, about, I want to say, 300 people, athletes. It could have been more Albert Einstein. And they talk about it wasn't just concussions. It was the repeated blows to the head. Yeah. So when you look at, you know, heading in soccer and other, you know, I remember my daughter getting kicked in the head as a goalie. I mean, so you're right, having the conversation, but is it time to rethink how we are doing sports? And feel free to anyone to weigh in. I mean, is this time to really have a reality check? Are we being rational, considering the mounting evidence? I know we don't have large samples yet, but I'm a little alarmed. Yeah, I think we need to be thoughtful as we're encouraging our kids to go and play sports. And I do think that many of these sports can be played safely if they're approached uh, appropriately. And, you know, when we look at heading in, in youth soccer, for example, what is the right time to introduce that and how is that done effectively? Are we teaching kids proper techniques as they're going to look at heading the, uh, the soccer ball? And all these things are extremely important. And I think at this stage, we don't know all of the answers, and right. I think we want to be very thoughtful as we approach this, banning a variety of sports. I think you know people have, have talked about that, but I think it's premature with what we yeah. know at the moment to be making blanket statements. But we want kids out being as safe as they can be playing, and whether it's uh, using a variety of different sporting equipment, techniques and how that's done it's it's a, it's a critical thing i have little kids this is very germane in my household mm -hmm. i got a seven-year-old boy and a five-year-old girl and they're out doing all this stuff and i'm having those same conversations at my house that you guys are having at yours any take from I, you Chris? i got three kids and i don't want them home sitting on the couch that's for sure yeah. i want them out there yeah. yeah the culture has changed though i have an eight-year-old and 11 year old they both girls play soccer soccer and softball Softball, you have to have a mask at third base, mm, at first yeah. base, and yeah. pitching, the catcher is in all that gear, and they use a softer ball than we ever did. But the culture has changed. It isn't that suck it up, play with pain, play through the pain. Oh, you got rung, get back out there. You know, that the coach that we talked to in Bremerton said, yeah, when I was a kid, you didn't get water if you didn't do the drill right. You know, and you can't get away with that anymore. And that's, mm -hmm. I think, these discussions are making those changes at high schools in junior highs and elementary schools. Of course. Yeah. All right. Well, Drew, thank you for sharing the story about the high school. Chris, thank you for your insights as an investigator. And what an innovator you are, Dr. Brow, related to this Vices helmet. If you'd like more information, not sure which camera I'm on, but if you'd like more information, you can go, you can text the word SAFE to 206-448-4545. We will send you some helpful links. All right. Thanks again. Let's go to Chris. Thanks, Angela. Mm -hmm.